when I talk to people and ask them, you know, they come to me and they have a problem or they ask a question about, you know, tuning their glider, and first thing I do is try to, you know, find out how their glider is flying and what their complaint is or what the issue is or what they want to improve or, or whatever. And, and very few people can describe how their glider flies. Most people can't even tell me how their glider is trimmed. And almost nobody can tell me if there's any difference in behavior, you know, at different PG centers. So before you tune your glider, you have to know um, how your glider flies and, and be able to describe it um, to someone else so that if they flew their glider, um, they would reasonably know what to expect with, with a high degree of confidence. And um, so you're so familiar with your glider, sometimes you just get kind of accustomed to the way it flies, especially if you haven't flown a lot of different gliders, you don't have experience on different things. So if your glider's trim fast, sometimes even if it has a turn. I mean, I remember like 1975 I had this glider, and I was flying it all the time, and I switched gliders with a friend. He said, that glider has a horrible turn. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't have a turn? And, you know, I flew his glider, and I was going, well, this fly is different. I went back and flew my glider, and I thought, this thing has a horrible turn. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you get accustomed to things. And, and you know, it's, you really need to spend a little time, um, you know, evaluating how your glider flies. So a big part of, of, of that evaluation is, is airspeed. Um, so if you have an airspeed indicator, you should get used to using it. You should use it when you're thermaling, when you're flying, when you're gliding. Just be aware of the speed supply because airspeeds are, you know, knowing your airspeeds um, is essential to getting good performance. Whether you're gliding, thermaling, or whatever you're doing, penetrating, or anything else. So um, your, your airspeed indicator ideally should be calibrated. Um, if you have an integrated um, flight computer, um, you can get that pretty close by just in the morning doing a two-way um, drive up and down you know, a long straight road. It helps to have somebody else driving because it's pretty hard to have <laughs> your barrier. You want to have it outside the window, way outside the flow field so it's not in the turbulence off your mirrors and everything else. And it's pretty hard, especially if you're over 40 or 50, which I don't see anybody, oh, I guess there's just one or two maybe on here. <laughs> I resemble that remark. So. So, it might be kind of hard, actually for me, it's really hard to, to kind of see those little numbers, you know, at, at the end of the stick out the side and still drive. So, um, you know, if you do two-way runs, you can, you, can, you can look at your GPS on your, your flight computer, and, and usually there's a calibration if you have a 60-30, or I think most areas have some way of calibrating um, the airspeed. And even if you can't calibrate it or adjust it, at least you have a reference for how your airspeed is. And, and having a calibrated airspeed is really essential for all the other flight computer functions, whether you're using speed to fly or you're just watching the, you know, the, the L over D readout or stuff like that. I mean, all of that depends on your, your airspeed indicator. So it, it's worthwhile you know, getting your airspeed calibrated. If your airspeed isn't calibrated, um, you can still use it, but just be aware that when you're talking to somebody else, um, the numbers you, you, you share, the trim speed, the stall speed, all these you know, other speeds, aren't necessarily going to be the same as the other person you're talking to whose airspeed you know, instrument is calibrated some other way. So a good way to um, kind of get around that is to reference those speeds compared to you know, one cardinal airspeed, like, you know, say stall speed. So I can say my glider's trimmed at, you know, three miles an hour above stall speed, or it's trimmed in a stall, or it's trimmed at, you know, but halfway between minimum sink and best glide. I mean, most people kind of recognize stall speed, minimum sink, and, and best glide. I mean, you get a pretty good idea for that after you've been flying for a while, probably within a couple of miles an hour. So if you at least reference those airspeeds when you're describing the way your glider flies, the way it trims, you know, when it manifests certain behaviors, if it only has a turn at higher speeds, at, you know, at 10 miles an hour best, above best glider, or if it has a turn throughout the speed range, you know, you have to describe it with respect to, to, to the airspeed. So after you get your airspeed calibrated, or even if you don't, um, there's um, a couple of things you really need to be familiar with, um, a couple of speeds. They're, they're stall speed, minimum controllable airspeed, 
minimum circling speed and trim speed and BD. That's like your steady state top speed. So, and to get those numbers with a reasonable degree of confidence, um, you either need to just, you know, you should be looking at them all the time. If you're flying your same glider, you should, after a couple of flights, know all those 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 speeds kind of by heart. But to, you know, to dial them in, it's pretty hard to do in the middle of the day in conditions like this. It's, you know, it's hard to get them within a mile an hour or two, um, and you probably don't want to even maybe be stalling your glider, you know, when it's rough, midday, kind of cranky conditions. Um, but, you know, as it glasses off, you can usually get those numbers with a precision of less than a mile an hour. You know, you can see something, you can see that, you know, you can consistently hold maybe the speed at 18, but, you know, every time you get to 17, you know, it kind of stalls or departs, and it's kind of right in between there. So you can, in smooth air, you can usually get all of these numbers, you know, dialed in certainly less than a mile an hour. In the midday, maybe it's plus or minus two miles an hour, five miles an hour, or something like that. So you, you got to, you know, wait for the end of the day. The other thing is, all of these speeds are different at every VG setting. So if you have a glider that has a VG system, you need to, I mean, when we flight test gliders, everybody remarks all these numbers and usually write, we always write down um, trim speeds at, at all our VG settings and our VD, our top speed, steady state top speed. And we all you know, pretty much remark all of the, these speeds as part of our flight test. And once you get, you know, good at it, you can pretty confidently get all these, collect all these, these speeds at all the different BG settings in about 10 minutes. So it might take you a little bit longer to do, but it's, it's really important to do. So by BG increments, I mean, we do it at BG loose, BG one quarter, BG one half, BG three quarters, and BG full. And most of these, you know, speeds, um, your stall speed, your minimum controllable speed, your minimum circling speed, your trim speeds, and your VD, all of those numbers are going to be different at every one of those VG settings. And maybe, you know, the increment of 25% is a little bit too small for you to identify the differences, but certainly you will notice on most gliders a difference in those numbers between VG loose, VG one half, and VG full. So get in the habit of, you know, thinking about those air speeds and, um, you know, when you're bored or it's the end of the day or it's a glass off, you know, trying to identify those numbers and be familiar with them. Because as I said, when I talk to people and I'm asking them how their glider flies, what's it trimmed at? You know, does it have any transient trim? You know, what's the stall like? How does it, you know, what's the stall speed? Is the stall speed different, you know, with VG on? Very few people can give me those answers, and it's pretty hard to diagnose how their glider flies without that. When I talk to Mike, you know, my partner, you know, he can tell me in, you know, three minutes exactly how a glider flies, and even though his flight evaluation is, is somewhat different than mine, I have a high degree of confidence when I fly a glider that he's described exactly how it's going to fly. I mean, there's just no surprises about anything. So that's your goal, is to be able to evaluate the glider with enough confidence to, you know, communicate that to somebody else. And that's the beginning of, of the flight tuning process, because you can't tune the glider if you can't recognize what your glider's doing. Um, so for slow speeds, um, it's helpful to have some tufts on your shell. You probably, if you ever bought a new Wilson glider, you see that little piece of yarn on your sail. Um, and that's, um, we started putting that on like 30 years ago because, um, you know, in talking to people on the phone, we had a couple of glider models that had um, a minimum controllable airspeed. The, the minimum speed at which you could control a glider effectively was a ways above the stall speed, maybe two or three, four miles an hour above the stall speed. So a lot of pilots had their gliders trimmed in this kind of mush, and the glider was unresponsive in this, this behavior, and uh, in this turn, and, and they insist they were, you know, flying fast enough, but essentially they're flying, when you put the tufts on, the tufts are, you know, flipping the other way. They're in a, you know, the beginning of a stall, and the gliders, gliders generally are are, are less responsive when one part of the wing starts to stall. 
And so um, we put tufts on the sail just to make people familiar with um, the minimum controllable airspeed, the stall speed, how close they are to stall, you know, what the airflow is doing on your wings. And, you know, it also relates to minimum sink. Um, so the minimum sink speed is the speed at which you're going to get your, your lowest descent rate. And usually that's just at the speed in which the tufts lay flat on the sail. I mean, it makes sense if the sail, if the airflow is separating from the top surface, that's a lot of drag and that's not going to help your performance. You want to go as slow as you can with fully attached airflow. So we put the tuft um, a little bit outboard of mid-span, usually in the single set, um, surface section of the wing so you can see the shadow on, uh, on the wing. If you don't have one, you can just put it on. We just use a little piece of sticky back. I mean, I usually have some in my harness. Ken has some, Mike has some. And if nothing else, it's kind of um, another opportunity to learn about um, the airflow on your sail and how it affects handling, how it affects performance and everything else. If you get really interested, you can put more tufts on the top of the sail and put a camera on your king post and you know, watch what they do when you're turning, when you're flying slow. Um, for example, when we put rake tips on gliders, we notice that the, the, um, the tufts at the tip, when you start slowing up, are much better behaved. They don't, normally when you're slowing up, the tufts start deflecting outboard, and then they start wiggling and flipping around. And then once you get really close to stall or start stip, stalling the tip, that stall progression moves quickly, moves quickly. Yeah, he says I use my hands more. <laughs> that stall progression progress moves fast across the wing. And with the rake tips on, what you see is that the, um, the tufts are much better behaved out there, which is also consistent with the glider having a little better performance and, and a, a, an, an improved minimum sink performance. So anyway, tufts are just, I mean, have been for 100 years for any aircraft evaluation, been a, a cheap, easy way to evaluate what's going on on your wing. And it's fun to kind of look at them and see what's going on. So that, you know, there, there's a lot to tough tape. I mean, you could spend, you could spend, you know, 50 or 100 flights evaluating things, you know, with tufts on your sail, because again, it's, it's really, you know, it's just a visual indication of everything that's happening on your wing. And as you change the tuning on your glider, the tufts are gonna behave differently. But just to start with, I mean, just having one tuft out there, one or two tufts out there to, to kind of see when things are starting is, is, and be aware of, the speeds you're flying and when you're initiating your turns relative to that initial stall progression um, helps a lot. Helps your performance, helps your controllability, helps your awareness of you know what you're doing. And also, I mean if you never see your tufts wiggling around, you're probably you know flying too fast. I mean I I talked to a pilot at Lookout last year, um, maybe the year before, and he'd um, he'd switch from a sport two to a U2. And he's, you know, about my size, you know, and he's been flying a 155 and I'm flying a U2 145. And we should have comparable um, climb rates and, you know, the glide in the U2 might be a little bit better, a little more speed range. And I asked him, um, you know, how he liked the glider. And he said he kind of liked it, but he says, you know, he, he was, his, you know, his sync rate performance was really poor and he wasn't climbing well. And, you know, the glider just didn't compare to the, 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 the sport and climb. And I asked him, you know, started asking about, you know, how he's flying the glider. Well, he's flying the glider with the bar into here. Well, you know, he's just, he's flying the glider like everywhere, like, you know, best glider or faster. Um, and he's afraid of letting the bar out. Well, you know, on a U2, I can get the bar out of here and I, usually I'm thermally out here. And if he had some tufts on his wing, you know, and he just slowed up in ridge lift, he could have, you know, without even stalling the glider, slowed the glider up and seen, you know, where he should have been flying. I mean, the reason he wasn't performing well is because he was, you know, he's just flying way too fast. And on a Sport 2, a Sport 2 has a very deep trim well, that is, the pressures on either side of trim. Trim is, of course, when the glider's just in, in stable, steady state flight. When you take your hands off, the glider just flies along at that airspeed. So on a Sport, on a Sport 2 155, the pressures on either side of trim, pushing out from trim or pulling in from trim, the pressure start increasing quickly. So if you're flying too fast on a Sport 2, it's telling you, like, 
slow down, slow down, you know, and, you know, eventually you get tired, you know, even if you don't want to slow down, you get tired of holding five pounds or, or more and, and you let the bar out. And you too, you put the bar wherever it is and it, it's happy to stay there, you know, you want to put it here, you want to put it here, it'll pretty much stay there. It's a pound, you know, it's nothing. So it's not telling you where to, where to fly. So, you know, so, you know, Again, so this is a performance issue. If he was aware of his air speeds, he would have been performing much, much better. So another issue that's relevant to flight testing um, and controllability and even describing the way glider flies is um, how your harness is configured. Um, I mean, I routinely, routinely talk to people who are having trouble with control issues or complain that their glider you know, maybe a Sport 2 won't go faster than 35 miles an hour. I talk to people all the time, like, it doesn't go faster than 35 miles an hour. Well, almost every Sport 2 I've ever flown goes 50 miles an hour, and a lot of them go 55. Right. Um, and yet, people say, oh, I can't go faster than 35. And when you look at them, they're hanging this far off the bar, and sometimes they have harnesses that are where the main supports are really close to their center of gravity, so as they pull in against all that pitch pressure, they tend to rock up. So what happens is they pull in, and they rock up, and their arms are this far away. And um, if I was flight testing and took off on a glider hanging that high, I would just come down and land. I wouldn't even fly it like that. You need to be close to the bar to have good control authority. And I don't mean, you know, close to the bar when you're pitched down like this. You're, in a level attitude, you should be close to the bar. And, you know, when I, when I give people hang checks, they often say, oh, I'm good. I'm two fists. Well, they got, like, an old, you know, 22 core conical chute sticks out to there, and then they're two fists. I'm like, you know, I, my covert with no parachute, I touch the bar. <laughs> you know, and if I'm more than this high off the bar, I'm really uncomfortable. You know, it's like I have greatly diminished pitch of the, you know, control authority, both laterally and in pitch. So, you know, look at how you're hanging. You really don't need to be more than, you know, two inches off the bar, maximum, when your body is in a level attitude. If you have to pitch way head down to get to your, your chest that low, then you're giving up a lot of control authority because your hips, you're kind of near your center of mass, are that much higher. You lowered your hips down two or three inches so you're in a level body attitude when you're close to the bar, you'd have just that much more control authority be much easier to turn your glider. Now, if you're accustomed to being way off the bar, you can't, it, it's really awkward and disorienting to just drop <coughs> yourself down. You just need to do it incrementally. You get, you know, through different muscles, it's a different sight picture, it feels weird, but trust me, Work your way closer to the bar, and you'll be happier. You'll have better control authority. You'll have more speed range. You'll have just everything. Look at any picture of Zach or Wolfie or Dustin or anybody. There, that's it. You know, you'll never see a good comp pilot hanging, you know, this far off the bar. It just, it just doesn't happen unless you're flying a rigid wing. So if you're flying a rigid wing, it's the control works the other way, like on an ATOS. You're articulating the bar, so you really don't want your body to move. You'd rather have your body just fixed so you can articulate the, the bar like a stick. So you want to hang high, so you can just do that. On a hang glider, you want to be close to the bar. Um, so depending on your glider model, you want to be careful about um, um, stalling your glider for flight testing. So if you have a, a Falcon or a Sport 2 or a Sport 3, these gliders are really tolerant of stall behavior. I mean, you can, I can take a Sport 3 VG tight, I can hold it out when it's doing this and push it out some more and it just keeps flying. On a T2, you know, I let the bar out, I let the bar out. When it stalls, you know, it'll, it'll, I'll get a little bit back pressure, but when it pitches down, I don't push it out again. I just let it fly fly away. Um, so, you know, don't go out there, and certainly when you're doing stalls, the proper progression is just a slow letting the bar out, like a mile an hour a second. If you're letting the bar out like this, that's a dynamic stall, that's a, that's a whip stall, a 
and you'll if you're certainly you're not supposed to be climbing and you don't want to get in this situation because this all will be really abrupt and it can be really dangerous so you don't want to do that um, so but you can safely you know saw your glider any glider um, and again you'll see the tufts get familiar with flying at minimum controllable airspeed and even on a T2 at VG tight where the stalls you know at v, with VG on on any glider the stall gets progressively sharper but even on a T2 at VG tight you know you get you know you're flying as slow as you can slow as you can and then you know it finally stalls and all the tufts go forward and it pitches down and it's, you know we're talking the nose drops you know 10 degrees it's not it's not like getting dumped at most of the thermals here today so it's not you know it's not scary as long as you're not doing a you know a flare to landing type stall or dynamic stall but Again, you probably don't want to do that in the middle of the day when it's ripping because if you hit a gust differential at the same time, if you get dumped at the same time you're doing a stall, you know, you're not, not going to, it's not going to be fun. So, but again, you, you need to be familiar with where your glider falls. And, and, and that's the reference I typically use for a lot of the other airspeeds, the trim speed, the minimum controllable airspeed, because um, even though stall speed isn't isn't a, isn't you're not really often flying at stall speed unless you're really you know working a really ratty small thermal and just using everything you can to stay in that core where you know the only part of the air is going up it is a small radius and your only ability to stay in that is the, the tightest possible turn then you're playing around with stall and you're not as concerned with minimum sink because all you care about is being in that core. But generally, you're more concerned with flying at your minimum controllable airspeed um, in, in light wind. That's the, the speed at which you have um, the, the airflow to be very close to minimum sink speed and you have you know fully attached flow and you still have lateral control at that speed. So relative to stall speed, Minimum controllable airspeed can be either right at stall speed um, on a glider like an Alpha, or it could be um, you know several miles an hour above stall speed. Um, on all the <coughs> gliders, you know, older high performance gliders, especially like HPATs, um, you know, there was usually a gap of about two or three or four miles an hour between stall speed and minimum controllable airspeed, and. Mm -hmm. And that was especially scary, like landing downhill at Elsinore in the middle of the summer, when you're, you know, you're going down this slope, this 15 to 1 slope, and you're gliding, you're gliding, you're gliding, and you get below minimum controllable airspeed. You have like no lateral control, but you're still not close enough to stall speed to land. So you're like, oh, <laughs> you're going down the hill. So most gliders today we close that gap between the minimum controllable airspeed and stall speed. So there's usually not this big gap between how, you know, your glider still, you can be somewhat responsive right up to stall speed. But um, you need to, and it, of course, this depends on the tuning of your glider too. If your glider, if there's a, you have a Sport 2 and your minimum controllable airspeed is, you know, three miles, three or four miles an hour above your stall speed, then there's something we need to adjust. It's too tight. It's not tuned right. It's you know probably it's just everything's too tight on the glider. Maybe your tip bands are too tight. The leading edge tension's too tight. The sail shrunk. You know whatever. But there's something wrong. So again, just being able to describe that is really helpful in diagnosing what what we can do to fix it. Um, the other thing you should. Um, oh yes. Yeah, so stall speeds also. A little slower with typically slower with with G activated. So on a um, something like a T2, it might be a mile an hour, two miles an hour. Well, it's like probably on most of, most of our gliders, the stall speed is is the lowest around VG three quarters, which which makes sense. There's more of the wing working there, and so you know you just have a little more lifting surface. Um, but you should be able to you know identify you know what the difference is. Um, one thing to look for when you're doing stalls is what we call stall hysteresis. And that is um, a glider that exhibits stall hysteresis is one that um, when you initially stall the glider, say it stalls at 17, and then the bar comes back and you know you just let the bar back a couple inches and you should start flying. A really 
LBT slider, a nice slider like 5155 or something. I have it out here bucking and it's, it's protesting and I'm holding in this mush and I relax the bar just a couple inches and it starts flying again right away. On a glider that has stalled hysteresis, that has some kind of issue or, or problem and doesn't have such nice stall characteristics, sometimes you let the bar back and it's, it stabilizes and it's flying again, but it's flying a little faster, you know, and, and you, can't, you can't slow it down to that initial speed. If that initial speed where it started to be in Sydney stall was 17 miles an hour, you know, you're flying 19 miles an hour and it feels like it's stalling there too. And the only way to get it flying again is to let the bar back further, like another six inches or so, wait for a couple of seconds, and then when you initiate the stall progression again, you can repeat it. But there's this lag. It's a, it, on the initial stall, it goes to a higher lift coefficient, then it kind of drops, and it doesn't achieve uh, the same maximum lift, lift coefficient until you get all the airflow on the wing attached again and, and start the whole procedure again. So the reason recognizing stall hysteresis is important is because it's usually associated with some kind of... Um, you know, some kind of tuning problem on your glider. Um, um, some kind of, usually it's, it's, you know, a defect, you know, your mylar is creased or wrinkled, or maybe you have, um, maybe the, you have a mylar leading edge and it's all exfoliating and coming off and there's other airflow disruptions there, or, um, you know, maybe, you know, there could be any number of things that could cause it, but usually it's associated with some kind of irregularity on the leading edge. The other thing that causes stall hysteresis is, um, on some gliders, it's much more pronounced. Um, it's probably evident to some degree on almost all gliders, um, but um, some gliders, like for example, Ultra Sports or Fusion Ones, when you fly in the rain, and the stall speed goes way up, and it has rotten stall hysteresis. You just don't want to be flying next to stall because it's when you do stall it, the bar comes back hard, and then you feel like, you know, still coming back, and you got to pull the bar. You don't, you don't really feel like you want to pull the bar in when the bar is pushing back at you, but that's what you got to do. You got to pull the bar in, wait, get the airflow attached, and deploy it. So anyway, when you're doing your minimum control of layer speed and your stall speeds, you want to try to recognize that when it stalls, does when I let off a little bit of pressure, let the bar come back a little bit, does the airflow? reattach right away and the glider starts feeling like it's flying properly. And if not, what's going on? We had a, um, a T2-136 demo at Wallaby like, I don't know, it's like five years ago or, or, or something and it was, um, we used to identify all of our demo gliders at Wallaby by put, putting this little Will's Wing sticker on the leading edge, the same thing that's on the King Post, a little vinyl sticker that's, you know, 10 or 15 mils thick, it's just, you know, can stick on the leading edge. <laughs> And that would um, hopefully save when we told people to go demo the glider so they wouldn't take some somebody else's glider and go demo. Which would often happen. <laughs> somebody go and say, where'd my glider go? Like somebody's marching down to the takeoff line with their glider. Anyway, so we had these stickers on the lead edge. And um, this 136 had this, yeah, really nasty stall hysteresis. And, we tried everything to get rid of it. We we swapped the mylar. We, you know, we thought the batten terminations were in the wrong place. We just, you know, we were just looking at, you know, everything to try to fix it. And and I think after we probably had five or six flights on it, and um, Mike said, I was ready to throw the thing out. And, and Mike said, I'm gonna take that sticker off. I said, Well, good luck with that. And he took the sticker off, and it was fixed. Yeah, it's, it's hard to figure because um, the sticker, the mylar had been replaced. The mylar is in perfect condition. I've seen gliders that have um, really creased and wrinkled mylar that you would think would have to exhibit this bad behavior to fly great. No sign of bad behavior at all. Yet I see other gliders that have some small defect in the mylar insert and have a problem. We take the mylar out, replace it with new mylar, or recondition the mylar, and um, they fly great. Um, so, um, you know, it just depends on the individual glider. Um, in general, 
I would say that if your, your mylar inserts are, if you have an older glider and you have wrinkles in your mylar insert, it's, it's probably worthwhile to pull them out and recondition them. It only takes, it doesn't take very long to do. You just roll them up, put them in the oven, put some tin foil around, some aluminum foil around them and, and a twist tie and cook them for 200 degrees Fahrenheit for like three hours. Then when they, they roll out, they'll be almost like new. And in most cases, um, most of my experience done doing this to people's gliders, um, even if the glider doesn't have any particular problem, if the mylar is wrinkled, usually the handling is better, the stall speed's lower, or it just, just flies better. It's not something you have to do all the time, but you know, if I owned a glider, I'd probably do it once a year. You should certainly do it every three or four years if you're flying regularly. Or any time you see any big creases in that. You run your hand down the mylar, pocket and if you have any big creases or irregularities there then be aware of it and, and you know you know perhaps you know, you know change them. But how much is it just to buy two new pieces? You I, I, I can't remember what it is. It's you know it's it's I mean it's not ridiculous but it's expensive. It's just it's just not that much trouble to recondition it. I mean you, we can cut new mylar for you anytime and that's what we used to do but Really, it's, it's probably less trouble for you to recondition it than to order it. And then you got to wait for it and, you know, everything else. You just, pulling it out is nothing, you know. You can just pull it out in two minutes. Um, it's putting it back in that's a pain in the ass. Um, so it depends on the individual glider, how you put it in. The only glider that's really, gliders that are really a pain in the ass to do is um, some older wheelswing gliders like Ultra Sports and Fusions and things like that. We had um, the Mylar Pocket was only accessible inside the sail through the nose hole. So if you have a, one of those gliders, and it was mine, I'd probably do it every three years and it's a pain in the ass. You have to dismount the sail up the nose, get the airframe kind of out of the way to pull the mylar out, and then putting it back in requires a little bit of, you know, manipulation and help. If you have a, a glider like a, a, a newer Wilswing glider or some older Wilswing gliders that have the, um, the mylar pocket accessible on the outside, then again, pulling it out is super easy. Putting it back in is much easier if before you pull it out, you can attach a string to the back end of it. Now in most school swing gliders, the mylar pocket, there's an opening at the back of the mylar pocket that's accessible. If there isn't, from inside the sail, if you stick your head in through the sprog zippers or through the tip or something in that else, you can usually see an opening there. If there isn't an opening, you can often make a, a small slice along the axis of the leading edge, right where there's a hole in the end of the mylar insert. The, the Ken or whoever's building the glider, final assembly of the glider uses, we have a long pole to just kind of push it in. So if you can tie a piece of string to that, then it's super easy to pull it back out. Um, or oftentimes, if you know another pilot, there's, um, that has, uh, you know, people tape a couple of battens together to push it in. If you have a long pole, Dan, Hey, speaking of creases in mylar, what do you recommend? Zipper up, zipper down on the truck. That's my question too. Um, so we use um, zipper up. I, I put, um, or a long trip, I put zipper down because when the zipper's up, um, the bags fill up with water um, so, and they don't drain. And, and if you have, you know, 30 gliders on the trailer, the trailer changes from 5,000 pounds to 8,000 pounds. And it's, it handles like shit no fun in the middle of the rainstorm, unloading 30 gliders, flipping them around, zipper the other way. <laughs> <laughs> like so, but normally, Will's Wing, we, we do zipper up. So it is laying on the mylar, but you know, again, the reason is because now you have the control bar and all that other hardware is sitting on, on top. If you go zipper down, just make sure that you're not, um, your rack's well padded and the hardware, um, you don't have any hardware interference issues there between the control bar and everything else. Wherever your cross supports are, they're not, you know, you're not having your control bar, you know, in between your rack and the glider, you know, taping everything up. The ladder and the glider? Not the rack. The ladder? The ladder. Um, yeah, so I've never had a ladder rack, and I don't know how that is wear-wise. I do know that, um, that having PVC tubes for racks especially the closed tube. Some people have a closed tube and they put their glider in that. That's really bad. Because typically the glider, you think it's, it's perfect. Gliders environmentally 
you know, safe and supported full length, but really you're driving down the road and the glider's just bouncing around in the tube and getting heat to help. Um, and the other thing is if you double bag your glider, that's another great thing to do if you got um, one of those um, rain bags you can put on and you can, then you can switch the zippers either way. So you could have zipper up um, on the regular glider and the bag and zipper down on, on, the, on the heavy duty, you know, rain bag. But if you use one of those bags, make sure that you unzip it. You don't leave your glider stored in this airtight, you know, you know, rain bag because the moisture in there will accelerate corrosion on your, your airframe. And, um, I mean, I've only seen a couple of 77 year five airframes that have shown any significant air corrosion, but there was um, a Falcon that um, one of our dealers back east you know, sent me pictures of that was essentially the airframe just turned to powder. He had it stored in one of those tubes and there was water in the tube. So it's just like a little humidity. Yeah, it, it's a <laughs> it's it's a corrosion, you know, accelerated corrosion chamber is what it is. And so we yeah. had that one lighter that came to the shop where they had had it in the tube on their truck. And the mylar had sawed through the sail <laughs> from, from bouncing. Yeah, no, they're pretty yeah, it's pretty bad. So don't 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 do that. If, you know, the main thing is, as far as storing your glider on top, is don't let it bounce around. You know, tie it down in at least. We, I mean, we're in and out here all the time. We just tell it tie it either end. But when I'm, you know, traveling anywhere, I, I put three ties around my glider. You know, one at each end and one in the middle. So at least three ties to stop that movement, because it's the, the chafing and the movement that's going to cause the wear and tear. And we're, we're kind of getting off topic, but, you know, with respect to wear and tear on your glider, I mean, when you're breaking down your glider, look for signs of wear and tear. <clears throat> because, I mean, oftentimes you have a little piece of hardware that's just chafing on the sail. If you, if you address it right away with a sock or the way you pack it up or something, it's not going to go any further. If you just keep letting it go, it's going to get worse. I mean, everybody packs their glider differently. Everybody's got different racks. So there's no, like, one way, you know, these wear problems, you know, develop. But if you just keep an eye on them, they don't usually, it isn't like the first time you, you drive someplace, it goes all the way through. Usually it just starts with barely noticeable little scuff and, and continues from there. So if you recognize that and address it, figure out what's causing it, you can, you can keep your sail in much better shape. Um, okay, so getting back to um, the speeds, you know, we did stall speed. Um, um, so then we have minimum controllable air speed. So we have stall speed and minimum controllable air speed. So minimum controllable air, air speed is kind of like um, your minimum sink speed, or maybe a, a little slower. It's the slowest speed at which you can, you know, just fly around and without, you know, wrestling your glide, you can make you know, roll reversals, you have relatively good control over your glider. And again, it's good to know how much above stall speed that is. This is important for landing, you know, when you're coming into land, you know, when you're going to start running out of, you know, control authority. So, um, and also for thermally close to the hill and everything else. And, and also, again, minimum controllable airspeed and how it relates to stall speed is another good, good indication of how your glider's tuned and, and whether the handling can be improved. Because if you talk to us, for example, and we're asking, you know, about how your glider flies and you have a Sport sport 3 and your minimum controllable airspeed is like 3 miles an hour above your stall speed, then it's not too right. There's something that's too stiff and you need to fix it. So you should just be aware of that. Then there's minimum circling speed. So this is really an important performance kind of speed and for to be aware of. At the end of the day, you know, Find out what the minimum speed that you can maintain a smooth circling turn in your glider and how that relates to your stall speed. Typically, it's going to be like four or five miles an hour above stall speed. And the best handling and performance gliders um, we want, you know, as developmentally, I want to get those numbers as close as possible together. But oftentimes, they're quite a ways away. If there's a big gap there, I want to know why that is and what I can do to fix it. So. Again, minimum circling airspeed is another good one to know and also and to evaluate and also see again how that about that that changes with DG activation. So most people just always thermal with um, um, DG off and that's fine. Um, Dustin thermal is always DG off um, so there's nothing wrong with that but you do get a slower stall speed 
and you get um, better performance, a lower minimum sync rate with DG activated. So if you're flying a Tory, for example, and you want to get high, and you want to work those little thermals, you're going to have to put the DG on, because you're not going to get high flying around a DG with the Tory. It's just not going to top out with everybody else. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, try thermal with low DG, you know. I mean, usually, <laughs> I mean, if we're flying, in, in T2s, we'd always be, at the end of the day, I'd be at BG three quarters. So with T3s now, I'm like, <laughs> BG overdrive, it's like, it's the whole BG, you know. Because um, it, it stalls me slower, my performance is better, sync rate's lower, everything's better. Um, so if you want to be the last one to land, then you need to start using the BG. Um, so then we get to trim speed. Um, so this is a big one, and one of the most important ones. Um, you know, where, what speed, relative to stall speed, or if you calibrate your airspeed, you know, absolute speed, what speed does your glider want to stabilize at when you relax your hands? You know, you have a little bit of pitch pressure and, you know, pulling in, a little bit of pitch pressure putting, pull, pushing out, and right in there, it kind of, you know, stabilize. If the air is at all active, you kind of keep your hand, got to keep your hand on the bar, or the bar starts, you know, going in and out. If it's smooth, you know, and you let go of it somewhere near there, it's going to stabilize. But you just kind of want to find what is that speed um, relative to stall speed that your glider's trimmed. And how does that vary when you activate your VG? So some gliders, like Sport 2s and Sport 3s, and for me, U2s, um, um, have very little change in trim speed when I activate the VG. But for example, Ken clips in a lot higher, uh, heavier than me, and Ken will typically on U2s have maybe as much as 10 miles an hour or more of transient trim. That is, the difference in the, the speed the glider trims, VG off to VG full, might be 10 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour difference. Where for me on that same glider, um, it might be one or two miles an hour. It's fast. Okay, well, in, in this example it does, but in other examples, um, it can go slower, so you need to know that. Like, for example, on Sport 3s, the sprogs typically engage in my weight around BG 3 quarters, so what will happen is, like the glider flew today at 135 Sport, Sport 3, it was trimmed at 21, loose quarter, middle, 3 quarters, and then in tight it was trimmed at 18 or 17, just to slow down like 4 miles an hour, because the sprogs can kick in, and, you know, and so that's, for me, that's, I mean, that's one of the ways we I can identify. If you can't see the sprog cables through the bottom surface, which you can on, you know, if it's a my clear mylar material, you can see the sprog cables and when they come in. Or if you're activating your VG and watching the sprogs, you can usually see right about when they lock in. But certainly, even with more precision, you can tell when the sprogs are kicking in because that trim speed usually just stops right there and starts slowing down. So that's. You know, if I was talking to a girl that had a sport, you know, sport two or sport three, and, and she was having trouble controlling the glider, and she said, well, as soon as I get past BG one half, the glider starts slowing down. I go, wow, your frog's just way too high for your weight. Um, you know, be, you know, that would be helpful to know that. Is there any negative to Ken's situation? Because mine's the same. I have a very noticeable trim change with the tip. It gets a lot faster, yeah. right? And that's well, okay, to me, so that's if it gets to be too much, um, there's some things we can do to, to um, reduce that. Um, in the case of U2, um, it's sometimes adjusting the shear Velcros a little bit tighter helps. Sometimes adjusting the keel pocket strap a little bit tighter helps. Um, the shear Velcros, which ones are those? Those are the, um, on the inboard ribs, there's Velcros between the top and bottom Perfect. surface. Um, and sometimes in tightening those just a little bit will help reduce that. Um, in some cases, um, you have to, um, if the glider kind of has runaway um, trim at, at high BG settings, you have to rate, it's an indication the sprogs are maybe too low. Could be other things too. I um, had a T2 that I got back from um, from Big Spring last year, one of our demo T2s, and it flew great. Um, but again, T2s for me have about about three miles an hour transient trim. You know, at the typical T2C, 144 for me, large trimmed out here, like right in a mush or right at the edge of stall. It's just like, just if it's smooth air, I can just let it go and it'll generally fly for a little while. And then at DG full, 
it's going to be like two or three miles an hour of salt. That's it. So this glider goes shrimp really slow with BG loose, and pulling the string and faster, faster, faster. You know, BG one half it's trimmed at like 30, BG three quarters it's trimmed at like 45. At BG full, so the bar just keeps coming back. I'm going like you know 65 miles an hour, and the bar's still in my hand. <coughs> This is, you know, this is weird, you know, what did Kevin do to this thing? <laughs> and so we didn't figure it out for a while. And, you know, I can't even remember how we figured it out, but I was looking at it. God, those wands look really low, you know? And I asked Kevin, I said, did you, did you turn the wands down? He says, oh yeah, they're down to the stops. <laughs> so in that case, um, you know, T2s, for example, are very sensitive, T2s or T3s are very sensitive to the the, the, the height of the wands for trim and actually effectively to change the, the trim speed at higher VG settings, not so much at lower VG settings. On sports, um, not so much. So, you know, some of these things just depend on the individual model and the remedies for changing some of the characteristics differ between models too. So the main thing again is being able to recognize it as you do and describe it and then then we can work on things to, to, to address it. But if you can't recognize it, and you don't know, you just know that you're not climbing well, or you're not having fun, or you know, you're having control problems, but you don't know at what speed or you know, what anything else, it's, it's hard to zero in on what, the, what to do about the body. So anyway, trim speeds, um, you, you need to know your trim speeds at all VG settings. And, and trim speeds also are, um, there's no right or wrong about how your, you know, your glider should be trimmed with respect to trim speeds. I mean, some people like their gliders trimmed fast, um, and one reason people prefer gliders, some people prefer their gliders trimmed fast, is gliders typically are more responsive in roll and control when they're trimmed faster. Um, and if they're trimmed excessively slow, um, they're correspondingly much harder to control, and you know even even if you're very familiar with 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 you know that model or you're used to slow gliders, if a glider's trimmed hard in a stall, it's it's just hard to pull in and move over. It's just and when you of course when you initiate too slow, the glider just walks up. So it, it's really um, yeah, it's really hard to do. The trim speeds adjust as the CG. Well, there's a lot of things that can affect the trim speed, but typically the thing that we that people would associate with changing trim speed is yeah, moving the hang loose forward or back. Yeah. That's the one. That's the, the most common and, and effective way to change your trim speed. But there are other there are a lot of other things that affect trim speed too. Again, the most important thing is you know knowing where it is and um, knowing it how it relates to how you fly your glider. If your glider's trim fast, you tend to thermal fast too because even if your glider's trimmed right at the edge of stall, I mean like a T2 for me, it's trimmed like right at the edge of stall. But in a, in a thermal, I'm, it's trimmed faster and I still have to push out. So I don't want my glider trimmed personally, me personally, I don't like my gliders trimmed faster because then I'm having, I get worn out pushing out all the time in thermals because I like to fly slow in thermals. Um, other people maybe fly shallower banks or bigger circles so it's not as much of an issue to them. They want the extra control authority um, for having the glider trim faster. Um, you know, there's, as I said, it's, it, it's a personal preference thing, but the most important thing is recognizing what you like and why you like it. Um, and, and so you have something to talk about. Um, we talked about transient trim. So the final speed to check is, is VD. That's your steady state, you know, top speed of your glider. Um, and, um, you know, that, that of course varies on the model and the VG, how much energy activation you have. Like an alpha, the top speed's, you know, like 33 miles an hour, which is interesting because when you tow behind, like, you know, a, 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 you know, one of the big motor tugs, you know, with a 912 or 914 or something. I don't think they fly that slow, especially if you got somebody who doesn't fly slow. So, I was wondering the first time I told them, "Well, how's this going to work? They don't, they don't slow down. They, don't, they go faster than I can go, <laughs> but it just drags you through the air. <laughs> it, it sort of works." Um, 
Uh, a Falcon usually has a top speed around 40 miles an hour, a Sport 2 around 50 to 55, a Sport 3, you know, 55 to 65, and a T2 or U2, 60, you know, 63 to 68, and a T2, 72 to, you know, 85 or something like that. Wow. Um, and it depends, again, how the glider's tuned. But um, you only want to check your VD in, in smooth air. Um, I mean, even we check the VD on we're, on every test flight. That's part of the test flight procedures. But there are some days when I just go, you know what? I'm not going to go that fast. It's just too, you know, it's too, in the middle of the day, I mean, you know, it's like sometimes it's just like, you know, you don't want to be mocking along at 75 or 80 and have your wings go, bang! <laughs> it's, just, it's just too scary. It's not a good idea, too. Plus, you have stability issues. And, and, and it's also important to understand um, the airworthiness limitations of your glider. There's, you know, you have some, some important airspeeds that you should know. One of them is BA, maneuvering speed. That's your maximum rough airspeed. Um, these are all numbers that are on your placard and in your own owner's manual. Then there's VNE, and the VNE, the never exceed speed on your glider, is typically 53 miles an hour. And why is it 53 miles an hour? The, the reason it's 53 miles an hour is because when we certify gliders to airworthiness standards, it involves a series of load tests, stability tests, controllability um, tests, you know, in-flight tests. And most of those tests um, are based on a 65 mile an hour um, load test speed. And so all the other um, um, pitch tests, flight tests, and everything are based on that 65 mile an hour speed. So that 65 mile an hour speed, how does that relate to 53 miles an hour? Well, 63 squared over 53 squared is one and a half. So if you have 53 is, um, offers a 50% safety margin over the demonstrated air speeds that were tested in airworthiness testing. So, and this is fairly common. I mean, tank glider airworthiness standards come from general aviation. And so, you know, there's safety factors in, in, in every product that gets designed. And in aircraft, the, the safety, it might sound like 50% safety margin is, is pretty good, but actually it's a very small safety margin. If you buy a ladder from Home Depot, I guarantee the safety margin's 300 to 500%. You know, if it's rated for 200 pounds, you can probably put 1,000 pounds on it before it buckles. So 50% safety margin at DNE is not a lot. On a new glider, it's great, but I mean, these, a lot of gliders around here are 10, 20, 30 years old. I've seen 30-year-old gliders that have the same side wires on them. You know, it's, so all of a sudden your safety margin gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have, if your glider is in new condition and configured, as it was, you know, manufactured, then you have a 50% safety margin over what demonstrated tests have been for the airworthiness standards at, at DNE, and you have a 100% safety margin at DA at maneuvering speed. So maneuvering speed, if you're flying a Cessna or something, that's the maximum speed you should fly in rough air, and it should be in hang gliders too. But hang glider pilots typically don't pay any attention to the placard of speeds. They're like. <laughs> What are those for? You know, like, <laughs> you know. I tell you what, when when I when I fly a Cessna, I never fly in the red. You know, you just don't do that. Yet, the hang gliders. You know, Ryan Boyd sent me a picture of his Vario going 117. Ooh, that's more than double BNE. So I can't remember what you know BNE in, a, in you know 172 is. It's you know probably 130 knots or something. And it's like, you know what would happen if you went 260 knots in 172? You wouldn't have any wings. <laughs> you know, they just wouldn't happen. So we have an extraordinary reserve of airworthiness. And, and that 65 mile, at least on our gliders, um, we typically test past that 65 mile an hour speed. And um, we don't usually certify to a higher B&E. Um, in fact, I think we're, we're the only ones that ever did certify to a higher B&E. &E. The reason why we don't certify to a higher B&E is because all the other tests are based on that speed, and there are some tests, especially the negative 30 test, that really doesn't correspond to the kind of airworthiness issues and concerns and failures we see in practice, and 
and it's it's really sketchy on the test. The glider is very unstable in this attitude, and it's easy for it to just turn sideways and fold up in a ball. So then you just destroy the glider without any relevant information. If we break a glider in a positive load test, well, that's relevant information because we know, you know, what to expect when when the glider, you know, how how strong it's going to be for aerobatic maneuvers and everything. But for negative thirty tests, it really doesn't give us any information. So. We typically test to as fast as we can go, as fast as the runway provides. We test our, our, our vehicle testing at Fullerton Airport, and the runway isn't very long. And, um, you know, we have nitrous on our truck, so, you know, we go as fast as we can. But if Mike, want, you know, if it was up to Mike, we'd probably end up right through the fence. But I, I get nervous when the fence is coming up and it's on the brakes. So. You, you don't try, you don't typically break a glider. We hardly ever break gliders. And, so you get a negative 30 pretty, at 50 miles an hour? Negative 30, yeah. Yeah, yeah I hate that. That's crazy. Yeah. And <laughs> Mike always lets the nodes go way too far down. I'm always so <laughs> He says, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's <great. laughs> Mike gets nervous, too. Like, you know, always going, there it's fancy. He's going, keep your foot on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you along the runway. Yeah. Well, we used to go out to El Mirage. We used to go to other airports and they kicked us out. But um, yeah. <laughs> we get we get the, we, we take turns with the airplane with the GA airplanes. We you know we're going up area lined up. And people are looking at us like, what are you guys doing? They, some people think we're going to fly away. <laughs> um, anyway, so VD, um, be careful about um, VD. Only do it in smooth air. And the other thing I should say about VD is it's it's a slow progression. You know, it's not, we're not talking about how fast can you get the glider. This is not an aerobatic maneuver. It's kind of whip, you know, pulling, yanking the nose down to get the nose down to come up to do, do a maneuver. This is just, you know, a steady pull in, you know, until your pilot pull forward. This is what we're talking about with VD. You can still go faster by, by doing this, but, you know, just a slow pull in until the glider stabilizes. And interestingly, in the middle of the day when there's a lot of activity, usually the VD isn't as high because every time you hit a bump, the glider kind of slows up. You can usually get going the fastest when it's really smooth. But as you're pulling in, if the bar pressure ever starts diminishing quickly, or certainly if it ever goes negative or go to zero, then slow up, you know, and, and don't go any further. Um, and, you know, this amazingly, um, they're, especially in the case of U2s, U2, so U2s don't have bridles, they just have two sprogs, just like a topless glider. And it's kind of popular um, culture that, um, and tuning out there that the answer to everything in hang gliding to some people is lower your sprogs. Um, so um, people just lower their sprogs on their U2s. Um, they lower it and say they heard, oh, four and eight degrees or six and five, you know, that's a good number, I'll put mine at that. Well, Sprog settings for U2 are like 10 and 13 degrees. It has a very flexible leading edge. It doesn't have a crossbar to stabilize the structure of the sprog. The sprogs, the sail isn't as flat or tight as a topless glider. There's no reason for them to go that low. It's got different airflow, it's got different stability systems. If you lower the sprogs on a U2 to the same settings as a T2, it's scary. Yet, there are a lot of pilots who are flying around every day with their their sprogs like that, and they're completely unaware. I mean, I, I've heard it from Zach, I've heard it from Dustin, I've seen it, people with YouTubes with their sprogs in the dirt, um, and they're flying, the and they're happy as can be, and they think it's great, and you know, Zach, Zach or Dustin or I won't even fly the glider like that, it's scary. You know, you pull the bar into here, it goes negative, well, it goes negative here, you know, and the transient trim is like completely runaway. You pull a BG full, and the thing's a lawn dart. <laughs> You know, and it's all because they, you know, lower their spots. So, again, if they knew this basic flight information, flight testing information, they'd know it's not good that when you pull your BG that the, the, the bar just comes back. They'd know that as they start to do their BD test, oh, gee, it goes negative right here. I better not go any further and figure out what's wrong with that. It's not right. That's not the glider should have return to trim pressure all the way through. That's what a stability is. We want to the glider to naturally want to return to its its trim position. If it's not, doesn't have a, a tendency to return to its trim position, it's not stable, it's unstable. That's the definition of unstable. It's that little picture you see of the ball on top of the bowl. You know, 
know, once it gets displaced, it wants to keep going. We want to be inside the bubble. We want the, you know, a good return to trim pressure. So you want to be able to identify that and test for that, you know, safely. Um, so now we get to um, lateral control. So this is, you know, typically what most people are concerned about with tuning is my glider has a turn in it. So, um, but oftentimes um, when they're when they talk about a turn, they're what they mean is, you know, when I'm flying straight, it wants to go a different direction. Well. That's what we call a moderate to severe turn. Most turns manifest themselves in more subtle ways. And a turn to us is any any difference in the behavior of the glider, you know, left to right. If it's more a little more low unstable to one way than the other, but as if you when you initiate a turn, it responds differently to your turn initiation one way than the other, you know, left or right. All of those are indications of, um, you know, subtle indications the glider has a minor turn. And you may as well, you may as well, you know, fix it. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, I guess. Um, I guess, um, so when you're evaluating controllability, um, I, I think there's, there's, there's kind of two different ways to evaluate them. Quantitative tests, time tests, um, or qualitative tests. Qualitative is, you know, just, you know, what feels right, more or less. So Mike will, my partner Mike, on pretty much every glider he test flight, test flights, does timed role reversals. You know, you can ask him, you know, we'll be talking about handing on gliders, and he'll send me an email with, you know, the last 50, you know, flight tests of some model with all the role reversal times for everything documented. So he does quantitative tests on all his gliders. Um, he knows that exactly, you know, sport twos varied from whatever, 2.8, you know, seconds in 2006 to, you know, 3.2 seconds in, you know, you know whatever, 2050. Um, you know, I'll have a, I, I don't use quantitative tests nearly as much as Mike do, but they're very helpful. I, you know, when he sends me an email, itemizing, you know, 15 years of tests on the same model glider with trends, it's really helpful. I mean, this is something that's not a, well, it felt like this. It's, it's an objective measurement of the performance standard of the aircraft. So quantitative tests um, are important, and we have to do quantitative tests um, for um, lateral control um, for airworthiness standards. You have requirements for how fast the glider has to roll, depending on um, where you are in the weight range and other, other factors. So quantitative tests are one thing. Qualitative tests are just as important. So qualitative tests might be, you know, how, how confident and secure do you feel flying a certain distance from the hill? Do you, you know, whether it's in smooth air or rough air, when you're turning back at the hill, do you do you have confidence that the glider's going to come around, or if you hit some turbulence, that the glider's going to respond in a way that's predictable and comfortable, and you're going to be able to complete the turn, or is it going to roll out and go the other way, or is it going to lock up and you're, you're going to be grabbing it down to trying to, you know, roll in? Um, when you initiate a turn, does it does the glider respond predictably and reliably, or does it sometimes adverse yaw and require an extra bump? Um, how much lag is there in the initiation? I mean, in a Falcon, um, when you initiate a turn, you typically get a response pretty much right away, and the roll rate is generally pretty much proportional to how much effort you put in. In the T2, the initial response is not very fast. It's almost not there, yet, when you're doing a roll reversal, a timed roll reversal from say 30 to 30 or 45 to 45, the roll rate is pretty much the same as a Falcon. So why is that? I mean, uh, it's because a T2 starts out really slow, but then when you're giving it maximum input, it starts accelerating. It gets going so fast that you're you got to stop and stop and, and reverse the other way. Otherwise, you're going to way overshoot your bank. So it's non-linear and not proportional 
to how much effort you're putting on. And that's why it requires more skill and experience to fly effectively. So those are qualitative evaluations. When we talk about qualitative evaluations, we're talking about, you know, in that case, in role reversal, primary role rate and secondary role rate. Um, and for a glider that's easy to fly and accessible and predictable, I mean, ideally we want a linear and proportional and predictable roll rate. But high performance gliders aren't, aren't, don't tend to be like that. They tend to be slow to respond initially and then have this you know, secondary high roll rate. And, and these non-linear responses, that is not a proportional and predictable response, when you combine that with pitch and roll and turbulence, this is how it makes it hard to control gliders because you don't know that you know, I'm just going to put in this amount and I'm going to get that response. It's, you know, it depends on a lot of different things. You know, so it's just important to understand the difference between qualitative and quantitative. And then it's, you know, and you want to have a series of tests to generally that you become familiar with when you're evaluating um, these, um, you know, lateral control. So. Um, so the most common tests we use are initiating a turn um, from like your minimum control of the air speed or minimum sink speed to like 15 degree bank. Just, you know, as you're, you know, if you were just, you know, ridge shoring and just, you know, give it a sharp input and what happens? Does the glider, if the glider is trimmed, to, tuned too tight, for example, to poor handling glider, and you give it a sharp input, what tends to happen is the glider just tends to adverse yaw and skid before it comes in. Or if it has a turn in it, maybe it does that one way and then you give it a bump the other, you do the same thing to the other side and it responds quickly. Well, it's responding asymmetrically. That initiating, usually these characteristics are more pronounced at low speed. So this sharp initiation, an impulse kind of input and how the glider responds at, 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 at um, you know, this minimum control of glider speed is a good thing to check both sides you know, in, in smooth air. And then um, at a little faster speed, um, maybe the speed where you'd feel comfortable thermally close to the hill. You're not going to be thermally next to the hill generally like this unless you're really confident and comfortable on your glider. What is your, um, what is your 30 to 30 roll rate? You know, how fast can you reverse from a 30 degree bank one side to a 30 degree bank the other side? How fast can you do a VG loose? How fast can you do a VG tight? know, and all your VG settings, you know, and how does the glider feel when you do that? So you should, you know, just do those same um, flight maneuvers enough that you have a lot of confidence in what to expect, and you can describe it to somebody else. Um, and then the other thing is, um, in a steady state circling turn to both sides, you know, is the glider roll unstable? Does it want to wrap in? How much do I have to high side it? You know, where is it trimmed? Um, and, and again, this is left and right. So if you have a subtle turn, you'll notice the glider wants to be kind of winding a little bit to one side, maybe roll out to the other side. Um, so you want to be able to identify those kinds of things. And so the last thing is, um, you know, takeoff landings and other flight conditions. So. Oftentimes, you know, somebody will tell us, um, you know, I, I always drop my left wing on landing, but the glider doesn't have a turn. Um, and why would that be? Well, you know, all these tests I've described so far, I said, you know, we're not going to do any dynamic stalls. We're not going to do any kind of abrupt stalls. So when you're landing, that's exactly what it is, it's abrupt stalls. So you're not really getting a chance to evaluate the glider in that mode. So you might, there's sometimes when you might only notice this tendency to always drop one wing um, only on landing. Um, so, I mean, this happens to all of us. I mean, you're coming in in rough conditions, one wing drops. But, I mean, just be aware that you're always dropping your left wing. Either you've got some kind of muscle imbalance where you're holding the glider improperly, or sometimes, you know, that's what it is. You just have your hands different and one arm's, you know, stronger than the other or whatever. But if one wing's always dropping, there's probably some tuning issue there, and in that case, it's probably just um, the strings on your, your first um, camber battens are too tight. They typically shrink, and when they get too tight, it causes that side to tend to draw precipitously. Or take the stickers off. Yeah. <laughs> that would be when the, when after the tip drops, the nose <laughs> drops down into the, the ground. Um, so anyway, um, 
yeah, be be aware of all all of those things. Um, are, and then are the footprints gotten a little better with that? The what? You're talking about string shrinkage on the on the flip tip battens. It doesn't seem like they would have a tendency. So we're going to get to flip tip battens and string adjustment and everything so, when I get to yeah. the tuning part. But um, you know, in in general, what I'll say about because I can repeat this again, I can repeat it ten times. Uh, it's really important. Um, all your battens need to be adjusted fairly and checked pretty much every time you fly your glider. Um, I mean, I. Uh, when I'm at Wallaby and, you know, it's not flyable or whatever, sometimes I just walk up and down the flight lines and I adjust people's battens. And invariably, somebody will come out and say, hey, what are you doing to my glider? I say, well, I'm adjusting your battens. Typically, what they'll say, well, that's the way they were when I got it. <coughs> <laughs> how, how long have you had your glider? Oh, five years. <laughs> so I adjust my battens every time I fly my glider. Ken sets up the glider, adjusts all the battens in, in final assembly. They're all perfect. I go out there and check them. They're all perfect. I come out in the hill. I go to clip them, they're all too tight. Why are they too tight? Because you roll up the sail, it's all wrinkled, and now they're too tight. Or in Wallaby, you know, the glider's sitting there, set up for a couple of days. Every single day, I have to tighten the battens two turns. By the time at the end of, you know, three or four days of Wallaby, the battens are like six, eight, ten turns out. And then I come back here, and you go to try to put the battens in, <laughs> <laughs> the flip tips are straight up and down. They're like a you know a half inch too tight. Um, so, but I adjust them every time I fly. It. So, uh, I'm curious in a situation like Wallaby, wouldn't it make millimeter battens, T2C battens, don't adjust them at all. They will never change. And even if they don't match the bat pattern, it's because the pattern's wrong, or because they were bent differently. And if you try to bend them, you'll break them. Um, Unless you're Jonathan, who can bend. <laughs> Mark still owes me a dollar. <laughs> um, but um, most other battens, um, if they're if the battens are within a half inch of your pattern, and they're symmetric, just leave them. Small variations in matching the pattern isn't isn't important. Matching them in symmetry from side to side is important. Um, I heard that the nose batten tends to flatten out. Depends on your nose batten. So if you have a 6061 nose batten, they flatten out really fast. And that batten is pretty easy to, to reshape um, because it's, it's fairly soft, um, 661. The bat, nose battens we've used for the last like five or year, years or more, 70, 75, um, 13 millimeter there, you can't change those. You put a crease in your knee, it's really hard to change. You're like, ow, 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 you let it go and it's the same. <laughs> so let's go back to proper tuning of batten tension. What's, what's your suggestion for? Okay, so now we're we're going to get to um we're going to get to the tuning part. Oh, so one thing I was going to say before we get to the tuning thing is um just as a general comment, um you should always have an expectation of how you and your glider are going to respond to every maneuver and every condition you encounter. So, um, I mean, oftentimes things happen to people they on launch or landing or in the air or something, and they, they don't, it surprises them. I, I, I mean, I think this is fairly common. Um, I, I think for me, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's very uncommon for that to happen because every time I fly, I have an expectation for every part of that flight, from the takeoff, to the conditions I'm flying in, to the way the glider's gonna respond, my landing and and it's not a big deal but I, I starting to take off I I think I'm gonna have to take three steps and I'm gonna take off there and if I don't if I have to take five steps or six steps even if I have a great takeoff and everything looks great that's a warning bell like why did I have to run twice as far as I thought I was gonna have to run you know I could have a great takeoff but I mean that's that's a reason to think, what didn't I anticipate? You know, was it the condition something I didn't assess right? But it only takes a little, it only takes a second. It's not a big formal deal. It's just having an expectation of how all, every part of your flight is going to go. And then when it, and right down to landing, you're hitting the cone, you know, landing on the cone. You know, having an expectation for all that gives you an opportunity to review your performance and your expectations and to make suitable adjustments before something bad happens. 
I mean, if you're always doing this, then it's much more unlikely that you're ever going to blow a takeoff because you're always leaving a margin and you're always going to be performing closer and closer and closer to your expectations. If you're not always evaluating this kind of thing, you're just, you're losing an opportunity to improve your skills and your safety. Um, so I just say that it's just, you know, just good practice to, to kind of make that part of your, um, you know, same thing flying close to the hill or anything you do. Just, you know, just, just think about what, how you think the glider's going to respond, how much room you're going to have. You know, what's going to happen if you get gusted halfway around the turn? Is the glider going to roll in? Is it going to roll out? Are you going to get locked out? You know, you know, be familiar with all that stuff. So now we get to glider tuning 101. Um, so all um, there's nothing filled in on here, but um, like I just started writing this the other day, and I, I just meant to make an outline like this last page, but then I, I realized that really um, evaluating your glider and flight testing is really the, the basis of any tuning because until you're familiar with your glider and know what to expect, um, you're not going to be able to tune the glider. Uh, so. And for the people that joined us late, he's going to post this online. If you don't have a paper copy of it, it's going to be available to you. So. I mean, if you want this paper copy like tomorrow or something, I, I can email it to you. If you want to just wait for, you know, till next week or something, I'll fill in the blanks and correct my, you know, other errors or typos or whatever and post, post it online um, next week. So you can have a little more of a reference. And, and again, this doesn't, this is like fundamental stuff, but I think um, in my experience talking to people and trying to help keep people you know, dial their glider in, um, if they were just aware of even a fraction of this, it'd be a lot easier to, you know, to identify what's know what's wrong and what what can be fixed um, so um, just I'll just go through this list really quickly and then anybody that has some um, specific questions we can come back maybe and, and, and talk about those things um, so the first thing is glider symmetry um, um, you know when I when I look at a glider somebody has got a problem it's got a turn or something first thing I do is walk around the glider and make sure the sail sitting even on the frame. You can pull up the nose cone. You can look at how the sail sits relative to the nose plate. If one side's pulled away over to one side, you know, that's an indication something isn't right. You know, if I sight across the nose and one tips up here and one tips down there, well, that's another indication. If the battens are irregularly tensioned across the, the glider, you know, obviously that's another thing. So it's just, the first thing you want to do is just kind of pre-flight your glider and walk around. And that's also you know, pre-flight. That's also an important thing that people tend to, you know, just skip. It's just like, you know, the longer you get away from your dental appointment, the more you forget to floss, you know. It's like, you know, it's just easy to skip that pre-flight. I did it last time, but get in the habit of pre-flighting your glider. When you just, it only takes a second to pull your nose down and look at, look at both wings and see that you forgot to, you know, zip up your Sprog zipper or you, something else looks weird or the mylar is folded under i mean this is it's not really a problem on any of the gliders we make now but ultra sports and fusions and a few of our other models often had a tendency when you're putting the battens in for the mylar insert to kind of buckle and fold under and if you didn't recognize that if you flew the glider like that the glider often flew really strange had a bad turn was trimmed really fast felt kind of divergent feeling was hard to land and all it takes to identify that is just running your hand down the leading edge or sighting down the leading edge. You can see it right away. It's part of a pre-flight along with all the other routine things. So if you're not doing your pre-flight, all your owner's manuals have to put pre-flight procedure in it or just grab something and ask somebody else how they do their pre-flight. There's no one way to do it. But the most important thing is to get into the same routine of doing it all the time. It only takes two minutes to check your glider. And, um, if you fly GA aircraft or something, you know, at least my flight instructor, when I when I learned to fly, I got my private pilot's license. If I didn't do a pre-flight, it would have been really bad because he was always leaving gas caps off and screws out and everything else. And, um, just learned pretty quickly to do careful pre-flights. So batten tension. This is probably the, the biggest thing. Um, yeah. Check your battens every time you're setting up the glider. And so there's um, 
If you have the flip tip battens, um, uh, I like to adjust them very generally so that there's just a little pressure just before the clip engages. So it's easy to see where that sweet spot is. If you screw them out to the point where, you know, maybe it's the, the, the lever is at 30 degrees or 45 degrees, it takes a big lever to, to you know, to, to, to engage it. You screw it in on three or four turns, and then it'll click about right. You screw it in a few more turns, and you'll find that you can clip the batten without any tension on your sail. So the sweet spot is just a little tension on your sail just before the click engages. And, and this becomes just second nature when you're setting up your glider. You just go across the, you know, that and you just, if it clicks too easily, you just turn it out one turn and, and, and engage it again. If it's too tight, you turn it in. Um, it, it, you can do it more precisely once the glider's all set up and the battens are in going across the trailing edge. But, you know, at least be aware of it. And, and more often than not, you'll find people that have their gliders, their bands really loose. Um, you know, so maybe it's three, four, five, six, seven turns before there's any tension. So, um, how does that affect the glider? Um, if they're too loose, you know, your sail's not going to be as clean as it could be. It's going to maybe have a little more twist. It might handle better, but probably not that much better. Um, your trailing edge is going to be more prone to developing flutter. Um, yeah, your trailing edge is going to be more prone to developing flutter, and the glider is, you know, going to be, you know, be more wrinkles in the sail than there needs to be. It's probably going to affect performance a little bit. It's not a big deal. And so, um, yeah, um, while our top surface versus the background top surface, it's like two turns change on a mylar sail is like four turns. You know, it takes four turns on a background sail. Yeah. So if you're talking to somebody about two turns, did it? Yeah. Yeah, on a mylar sail, sometimes it's like it down to like yeah, one turn, yeah. one way is too tight, and one turn the other way is too loose. On a deck on sail, there's there's a little more range there. Are they all supposed to be exactly the same? So we used to, um, yeah, we used to say the root batten should be looser and the tip batten should be tighter. The tip batten's being tighter to, to kind of um, prevent flutter from developing. The root batten's being looser because that generally improved handling more. Nowadays, I pretty much set them all the same. Um, so, because flutter is not as much of an issue with battens being closer together and with speed battens. Um, but if you do have flutter developing at the tip, generally it's it's more effective to tighten the battens a little bit tighter. Um, certainly if the battens are excessively loose um, at the tip, the sail will be more likely to develop flutter. And then, um, um, so, but yeah, just, for me, all the way across the same is, 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 is fine. How do you judge the string? That's so the good. string is um, the string is the one that usually causes the most problem because it um, it tends to shrink. It you know it sucks up water and dries tight. They're, they always get tighter and tighter and tighter. And those when they're when those strings on the, the last batten are excessively tight, it really hurts handling and causes you to drop a tip on landing and things like that. So um, for flat spinning. It's good for some things if you want to just do. Um, so it's the same thing. I um, I mean, when you're looking at the sail, the tension when you're using the clips or the string, you want the tension to be just tight enough that when you're watching the sail along the the right above the batten, those little lateral wrinkles will just start to disappear just when the batten's engaged. So you want it just tight enough that the batten the, the wrinkles disappear, but not so tight that the, the tension is forcing the batten to make a big print or crease into the sail. Um, and it, in, in the case of the string, that's usually right about the tension where the string just, you know, with a little bit of tension just goes over the nub, but not so tight that you have to use a tool or it puts a crease in your finger to do it. Um, and, um, some of our gliders, alphas and stuff, have bungees. Older gliders used to have bungees. Um, some older gliders, somebody, maybe some of you guys still have gliders that have spring battens um, that aren't really adjustable. So in those cases, that's a little bit, you have less room and latitude for, you know, they're not, not as, um, they have other issues associated with it. You can't adjust them and they're subject to, your sail changes in, in, in flight. If you do some, you know, pull-ups or aerobatics or something, the glider's completely different. You know, the sails all slid forward, the bands are all loose. So. Anyway, just, just check your bands routinely.
Um, so leading edge tension and um, wand tension and balance, those are, um, some of the gliders are easy to adjust the leading edge tension depending on the hardware configuration, others aren't. Um, on Falcons, for example, we have little, little shims that we put in between the sail mount plug and the end of the leading edge to tension the sail. Um, generally, if you, you have a new glider, you don't have to change the sail tension, but as gliders get older, depending on the material, um, you might have to loosen them or you might have to tighten them. And the leading edge tension is one of the most significant and important tuning you know, tools you have for changing the um, controllability of the glider. Um, and generally, as you loosen the sail, it becomes more responsive, and as you tighten it, the sail gets cleaner and less responsive. But it's not a linear thing. It's like, if you continue to loosen the sail, it doesn't keep getting handling better and better. In fact, it, it might be more responsive, but qualitatively, it starts getting really weird feeling. Um, it doesn't, doesn't feel right. Um, and similarly, when you tighten it, oftentimes, you can, if a sail is too loose, you tighten it, the handling doesn't get worse. It doesn't get worse. You keep tightening, it doesn't get worse. Then all of a sudden, you get to a point where sometimes, again, depending on the sail material, an eighth of an inch, just a couple of millimeters, you tighten it that last minute, and all of a sudden, the handling goes from, it was great to, this sucks, I'm putting it back. Um, so um, generally, again, you're not going to really change that unless you're having an issue. If you have if your glider stiff or uncontrollable, then, then probably, you know, we'd look towards, you know, changing your leading edge tension on, on some gliders like Sport 2s or, or late model, uh, late model U2s and Sport 2s. You, it's hard to adjust. You can't really adjust the leading edge sail tension. You can only adjust the wand tension. The wand tension has pretty much the same effect as the leading edge tension in that um, if you just trim the wands, if you have a, if I have a, a, a Sport 2 or something that's a little bit too stiff, oftentimes trimming the wand length by an eighth of an inch makes all the difference, handles much better. Um, once you get that, typically once you get the wand tension and the leading edge tension right, there's a balance between them and a relationship between them. You want to try to keep that. Um, but again, it's um, this gets into individual details that varies between models, between gliders, between materials, and other things. It's just important that you kind of are aware that you know the tensions on the leading edge of the wand affect uh, and the wand affect um, the way the glider, um, the controllability of the glider. If you don't shorten it, you can't lengthen the wands. The wand, you can wait. You can lengthen it. Yeah, you could put shims in it. Very, it's very seldom that you end up lengthening it because the sail out there tends to, um, if anything, shrink. And when I look at older gliders, it seems like the wands are just getting tighter and tighter, rather than looser and looser. So, um, now, if, if for example we had a, we trimmed or, or shortened the um, the wand to make your glider handle better, and then the sail stretched out later and was more responsive, you might want to tighten it. Um, but that you can shim wands too. And just put a little plug in it. So then um, we get to correcting for turns. Um, that's that's a common thing. Um, uh, that's one of the things we're most looking for when we do our flight test to make sure the glider is you know symmetrically balanced, doesn't have a tendency to wind in one way or another, or have different characteristics side to side. And the way we usually, the way we, the most effective way of adjusting for turns is on square tip gliders, that, that sail mount plug that um, the webbing anchor goes over, um, that's adjustable in orientation. So by twisting that one way or another, if you look inside your, your Falcon leading edge or Ultra Sport or something like that, you'll see a little sticker. Twist the correct left turn, twist the correct, this way to correct right turn. There's a little sticker on there that tells you which way to go. And on our gliders, there's a, a little Allen head bolt that has a that draws a little clamp in there, binding clamp to stop the, the plug from turning. And all this is in your owner's manual, but you just loosen that and twist it um, um, to correct for a turn. On um, gliders with wands, it depends on our gliders, it depends which model it is. Um, on T2s, we have a, a bolt that you turn that changes the wand up and down. On Sport 2s and U2s, there's a screw, anchor screw for the cap end cap that um, the one receptacle um, is, is, is secured by. You take the screw up and you turn the cap and there's other little holes drilled there that give you an indexed rotation. And again, there's a sticker on the back of the leading edge that says 
turn this way to correct one turn, turn this way to correct another turn. Um, changing those, um, those taps in the same direction, up or down, can also change um, um, the trim speed and other characteristics of the glider. Um, and on some models, it's more subtle and effective than others. For example, on T3s, um, the prototype T3s, we had that one set at the same settings that we have T2s set up. And we found that um, in rough air, turbulent air, at VG loose, the gliders had a tendency to roll out, which you know might be okay on some models, but that's not what we want on T2. We want the glider to, or T3, we want the glider just in, in, in whatever you're flying, we want it to just stay in that same attitude. So just lowering the, the wands just, you know, a half an inch at the tip, fix that. The glider, you know, you know, then just kind of sit stable in turn. So it's very sensitive in trim speed. The wands are on a T3 are very effective at changing um, transient trim, the range of transient trim, um, and also correcting for roll stability and other things. On sport twos and sport threes, twisting them up or down has a small effect on trim speed but it's not nearly as pronounced as on a T2, but they are very effective for correcting turns if you have any lateral asymmetry. Um, Sprog settings, um, this is my pet peeve um, with comp pilots, um, with inexperienced comp pilots. Pretty much, they have one word in their vocabulary for tuning, and it's adjust the sprogs. And typically, the sprogs have very little to do with the way the glider flies. And why do I say that? It's because um, in EG loose and quarter, where we do most of our, where people are most concerned about the handling of the glider, the glider is unresponsive, it's stiff, it's hard to control when they're firm, when they want you know, to handle better. If you put a camera inside the sail or if you have a clear bottom surface and you can see the cables, the cable is so loose that it's, it's laying on the sail right next to the, the sprog. It's got so much slack in it that it couldn't possibly be affecting the way the glider flies. You could take the sprogs completely off. You could disconnect the cable entirely and the glider would not change in its behavior. Yet they'll insist on lowering their sprogs a turn. They have a turn in their glider and so they'll lower their sprog to correct the turn. Well, so now instead of, you know, a half inch of slack in the cable, there's a half inch and you know and you know a thirty second of an inch of slack in the cable. It doesn't make any difference. Um, what they needed to do was just turn the bolt at the tip a half a turn and would have fixed it. <laughs> so um, generally with your sprogs, you, you, you don't want to change your sprogs um, unless you know what you're doing or you call and talk to somebody. Um, <coughs> we flight test the gliders at the factory. We do, you know, our controllability test, we do our VD test, you know, Ken sets them to the um, to the airworthiness spec in, in, the, in the shop. We know how much margin every glider has. Some gliders have more room to, to adjust them than other gliders, like U2s. You, there's a threshold below which you just can't go. Um, other gliders might be a little more tolerant. But unless you know what you're doing, you probably don't want to adjust your spogs. I'd say the one the one thing, the one exception to that might be if you have um, a glider where the sprogs are clearly engaging in flight. For example, when you're checking your, your transient trim and you notice that when you get the VG full, the glider slows up, the sprogs are hitting the sail, and you've got a turn that only manifests itself at full VG tight at high speed. And at all other speeds in VG settings, the glider handles, you know, well and is. Um, doesn't have a turn in it, then that's what we call a sprog turn. So typically to correct that, we just lower the sprog one turn at a time, or even a half turn at a time until it, it, it's, you know, it's straight. So pulling to the right, we lower the right sprog a half or one turn. Um, bridles, um, bridle adjustment and shimming. Um, generally, if you have bridles on your glider, um, certainly if you have a, a Sport 2 or um, probably a Falcon, you're not going to have to adjust them. On older gliders, um, gliders like Gram Airs, HPATs that had really long bridles that went way outside to the outboard section of sail before we had sprogs to support the twist out there, 
Um, and those gliders, those high performance gliders, also had um, very heavy fabric on the trailing edge that was subject to shrinking. Those gliders, um, oftentimes, most often, the sail would shrink, and so the stabil the main stability device for those gliders, since we didn't have brought the sprogs, and oftentimes we took off the washout tubes to have these long bridles way out the side on the sail. Um, those, um, as the sail shrunk, the stability devices got lo looser and looser and looser. Um, and you can't tell by flying the glider, except that um, the glider seems to fly fine, but if you put it on the test vehicle, actually we put Ken's glider on, Ken's HPAT on the test vehicle, see it's flying around, midday, happy as can be, glider flies great, we flew the glider, flew great, everything feels good, put on the test vehicle, it's like, oh, that looks scary. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, his bridles were just, really slack because his tra trailing edge shrunk and uh, we, we put little shims back in there until it was at the, the factory spec that we test you know when we flight test the gliders we set VG tight and wiggle the control bar and watch the bridles and make sure they were just the right slack in the bridles so we shimmed it back to that condition tip test it again it was, it was great just right back to the original spec um, so again most of you guys don't have to check your bridles but um, so just something to be aware of Mylar reconditioning, I already um, talked about that. Nose cone security or, or, or check. Um, I oftentimes see people whose nose cones or our nose cones on our, mo on our recent model gliders are tied at the back with a little string tethered to the sail. Um, older gliders have Velcro that secures the nose cone to the sail. In any case, you don't want to have your nose cone lifting off the sail. You don't want to have big gaps between your nose cone and the sail. This goes along with the the thing I was talking about, irregularities and defects on your mylar pocket. If your nose cone is lifting, you've got basically a flap spoiler on your nose going up and down with big gaps there. You just fix it. Replace the Velcro or tighten the string or whatever until your nose cone sits securely with no gaps to your sail. Heel pocket tension. Um, Generally, this isn't something you're you're gonna you know adjust. Our gliders have a strap from the back of the keel pocket to the the rear bolt. Um, some gliders don't have any security um, anything there. I guess the only thing you need to be aware of is generally that strap should have a little bit of slack in it, um, uh, but um, not be excessively tight or excessively loose. Um, um, there are some tuning you know effects of the strap, but um, Usually it's um, specific to a certain model, like for example, Sport 2s or um, Sport 2s at the bottom surface, or Sport 3s at the bottom surface, has some flapping in it. It's usually because the sail is sliding too far forward. It's because that strap is too loose, so we just take the strap a quarter of an inch and it fixes it. Not something you generally mess with unless you have an issue. But an old glider often has a very tight heel strap. Could be could shrink, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So if it's too tight, it might cause some problems, or it might not. Um, you know, depends on the individual glider. You know, if your glider flies great, then I wouldn't mess with it. But if you're having a problem, again, that's something to be aware of. Um, shear ribs and velcros. Um, not really a lot to do with shear ribs, although the velcros that the velcros I'm talking about. This you'll notice if you look inside your body surface on. Um, <laughs> like U2s and, and T2s, there's a Velcro um, that goes between the top and bottom surface that stops the sail from kind of breathing and adds a measure of um, longitudinal stability to the glider, increases pitch bar pressure. So it's just um, it's not something you need to um, usually adjust, but when you're doing your pre-flight, if you look inside your bottom surface and you see these pieces of Velcro and they're just floating around not attached, they are supposed to be attached. So, And there's little marks to attach them. And, um, just, just grab a can and ask them to stick them back together for you. <laughs> if they're supposed to be attached. Uh, and make sure those uh, shear ribs are Velcro, I mean zipped. Yeah. I've stuck my head in people's gliders and they were wide open. Yeah, exactly. It's scary because if, if, you, if you dive the glider with that, watch out. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the shear ribs are very important because before we had, um, and, and how would they get unzipped? Well, they got unzipped because you're messing around inside your bottom surface doing something or taking the glider on and off the frame. You There's a lot of reasons to unzip your, your shear ribs, but just zip them back up because before we had shear ribs, um, what we had was long battens. And, and, um, 
that's another shear ribs were another wheel swing, you know, kind of innovation, and they um, they replaced having long bands without battens or shear ribs in a glider with a lot of bottom surface. What happens is the bottom surface blows up, and that's um, that's destabilizing. It causes the the wing to wash in at the tip as you go faster. And on Ram Air, as the first glider production glider that we had, we had shear ribs on some HPAT prototypes. But the first production glider was um, on Ram Air. Just by changing the shape of the the shear ribs, I could change the glider from having positive increasing pitch pressure to like lots of pitch pressure, or I could have it so basically the glider would be a lawn dart. I'd just pull the bar in and the more the pull the bar in, the more it would just kind of go over the edge just by changing a little bit of shape of the shear ribs. Um, so they're really important. It's really important they stay zipped up. Um, back symmetry, we talked about that. Um, other maintenance, um, there's a lot of maintenance issues on, on, you know, a lot of people have older gliders and that's great, these things last forever, but um, be aware that if you have an older glider, you know, there is some maintenance you should do to your glider. Um, and uh, Jonathan tends to put a lot of hours on his glider, so he's, you know, he's actually shared a lot of maintenance issues with me because I, I don't tend to have gliders that long, but... Um, 1170 hours on a T2C. So when you have that many hours, yeah, you um, you have to do things like you know, lube and clean things. In general, you just want to keep your you know keep inspect your glider routinely, change your side wires periodically or any time that they ever have a kink in them or any damage to the cable. A cable if it if it's clean, it doesn't have any corrosion, doesn't have any dents in it. There's no reason to replace it more than every you know few years or or, or longer. But if it has, even if it's a new cable, if it has a kink in it, a bend, you want to replace it right away. Because that bend, I mean, you can take a brand new cable, just bend it with your hand in half like that, and then load it to like 100 pounds 50 times, like when you're flying, um, and then it'll break like 50% of its rate of strength. So. The strands are broken internally, you just can't see them. It's just like a coat hanger. Thing. Yeah. You know, it just does that. So, so if you have... I mean, there was an accident, um, was it here? Raffi Laven at uh, Funston was one. There was one here, Rob Kell, um, uh, there, was a, there was a girl that um, Rob said, you, you need to replace the side wires now. A year later, she had a replacement side wire sitting on the front seat of her car when her, uh, her side wire would go. Mm -hmm. you know, so. It's a good idea to every so often buy a new boat. <laughs> I would, I would say that's a, that's, that's really important. <laughs> so pre-flights, annual airframe inspection, you know, periodically, I'd say, you know, if you don't want to do it, you know, get your local dealer to, um, I don't, wouldn't say you'd have to do it <laughs> annually. It depends how much you fly, but it, it's good to periodically pull the airframe out and inspect it. You, there's a lot of things you really can't see until you pull it out. It doesn't take that long. Um, Yes. Recognizing fixing flutter. Um, we used to um, rework sails if you've got an older sail that's the subject to flutter. Don't keep flying it with the fluttering. It only beats the sail. It's just like having a flag that's flapping all the time. It just beats the sail to, to, to crap. Just um, either fly slower so your sail's not fluttering or get it fixed. We used to have to um, re scallop the sail or add take ups to the sail to fix it. Nowadays, we can just put speed battens on. You can put them on yourself if you're, you know, handy with that kind of stuff. Or we can, you know, sew the speed battens on usually without even pulling it off the airframe. But, you know, do something about the flutter. Don't keep flying it like that. Leading edge inserts, we talked about, um, you know, reconditioning those. Um, carbon inserts, um, you know, there's other things too. They're not really hang, harness tuning, hang height. Attitude leg straps. Um, if you're having troubles with landing or, or controllability, um, just be aware that your harness configuration can, can be a part of, of all those things. Um, and, and you know, you can get some help from somebody who has some more experience to help you get that, that settled in. I mean, if you're not having fun, if things aren't right, if you're having trouble with your glider or landing or something, there's a lot of experienced pilots around here that you know, find somebody that. That it's working out for and, and drag them aside and say, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a question. What's the official BP setting for takeoff and for land? Okay, so there's, there's no official setting. I would say 
Um, most people seem to like the VG one quarter um, because the, the, the stall's a little more brisk um, and, and easier to get a complete flare. For me, it's always VG loose. So why is it VG loose? It's because the thing I'm most concerned about on landing especially is to get rid of your, some of the slack in the, in the sidewash to make the glider a little easier to ground handle. For me, it doesn't really matter. Um, for landing, what I'm concerned about, I'm only concerned about one thing, is directional control and having the glider in a stable, steady state glide path. Because if, if, if the glider is yawing around, um, or if I get, you know, gusted and the glider, you know, gets, gets bumped to one side and I lose directional control, I've lost the, and the, and the flare window's coming up, I can't flare if the glider's even 10 degrees sideways. I'm going to have to run out my landing or I'm going to flare and the glider's going to drop a tip or it's not going to be an ideal landing. So the most important thing for me to have a successful landing is being able to have a straight final, keep my wings you know, level, balanced, not yawing, and, and doing that in turbulent conditions is, is a challenge. And sometimes in really turbulent conditions where you're, you're, you, know, you probably shouldn't be in the air, the thing I'm most concerned about for safety on landing is not getting turned downwind. You know, and there are times, you know, when you're landing, if you're landing a gust front or something really bad's happening, the only thing you want to do is make sure you don't get turned downwind. Because if you get turned downwind and it's blowing 25 or 30 miles an hour, it's not going to be good. And so the way I do that is to have maximum control authority on my glider to be. And I'm usually not worried about being able to flare the glider because even if I have to run out my glider or I miss my flare timing a little bit, nothing's really going to happen. Even if I just don't flare at all and slide in on the base tube, nothing's going to happen. But if I go off 30 degrees and drop my nose, I'm going to take out a down tube or it's going to be ugly. So as long as I can fly straight, usually the outcome is going to be uneventful. You didn't see my first flight in Yad S3, did you? <laughs> You're looking right at me. You, you don't want to see it. Go look at a, a YouTube Apache made. The first slide on that. The wind just had its way with me. Yeah, so that's why I'm, flat, I'm BG loose. But but again, a lot of people like BG one quarter. You don't lose that much control authority in BG one quarter. So, launch, so the only reason to fly with to launch with a little more BG is to take some of the slack out of your side wire. If, if you're bothered by the wiggle in the bar, then pull a little bit of BG. But don't pull so much BG that you're going to compromise your, your control authority. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll, um, I'll fill in the blanks um, and, and post something online for you guys. Um,